Welcome to another session of Advanced Algorithms. Last time we had to stop in the middle of the discussion of uh, randomized binary search trees. I left the slide with the spines in the collection because we need that later on. So we saw that, so well in the beginning last time we saw that, uh, at the beginning we saw that random binary search trees are well behaved. Um, if the input is randomly ordered, then they are um, close to optimally balanced, even in a with high probability sense. And we saw two ways how to enforce this shape of the trees, even if we can't rely on a good insertion order. And the first one was trees, where we assigned random priorities to each key when it was inserted and uh, ordered the key the, the tree as a search tree according to the keys and uh, as a heap with respect to the priorities. Now there's uh, two points of criticism that I had for the trees. Um, in particular, the second one is something we can do better. Uh, we have to store these priorities, but they don't help us in any sense to do anything other, to add any other cool operations on the trees. I also introduced the idea of the alternative of randomized binary search trees where we simply uh, enforce the random uh, distribution of the tree after each operation, which meant if we insert a new node, a new key X, that then first becomes a leaf because it's inserted using the ordinary BST insertion procedure. And there's a certain chance that this node in a random BST should have been the root of a certain subtree. So for all the nodes on the path to this new leaf, these are all roots of a certain subtree in the, in the whole tree. And with a certain probability that's exactly given by this, the one over the size of the subtree in the new tree, so counting X, uh, that's the probability that X is a uh, is the root of this subtree in a random BST given that the outermost structure is already fixed. So given that these keys form a subtree at all. And so what we can do is we start at the root and flip a coin with the probability given here, which, all, which always depends on the subtree size. And uh, if that turns out to be one, then we replace the subtree by a new one where now X is the root. And we will have to see in a second how we can exactly do that without, well, spending a lot of effort. And this required us to store the subtree size in each node. So we, we still need additional memory, but unlike for the trees, we can do something with that because the subtree size is exactly what we need to use uh, rank-based operations um, which are often helpful. And so, uh, well, in many cases, you would like to store that anyway. Now, deletion is um, a bit different in that uh, we, we already have the node in the tree, so we know where to delete it. But then what we are left with in the general case is the two subtrees of that node. So we have to somehow merge these. And we can do that by just, um, well, picking the root of any of the left or right subtrees as the one that replaces X and then recursively doing the same thing. And we just have to uh, pick the right probabilities and then again, everything works out nicely in the end. So the basic uh, ingredients that we're missing is here, how to join two trees into a single one and here how to split uh, a tree so that we can insert X as the new root of a subtree. And that's what we're um, gonna do next. Here's the, the code for insert that just makes use of this random, of this uh, procedure insert at root. This is a, a randomized procedure as you can see here. It always picks a uh, uniform number which is between zero and n minus uh, an n, so 
are one of n plus one choices because n is the size before we updated it. So this is um, in total the, the insertion procedure uh, has a, a, a third step that I left out. It also has to update the subtree sizes. That's something that you should do after coming back from the recursive calls. Uh, but I left that out in that, in that code to not clutter it with that. So what the procedure does, it recursively descends in the tree. And as long as you don't find the, the key in this, um, okay, you already assume that it's not in the tree. So maybe there's a zero step before. You first search it in the tree, and if it's already there, you don't do anything. If it's not in the tree, you know you either have to insert it left or right. Um, and we need a base case for null. Uh, that's really missing. It wouldn't work like that, right? So we should add, if, if root is null, then we just return a new node that contains x. So it's the usual BST insert, but at each step, you flip a coin with the corresponding probability because this is just one of these values. It's got the probability 1 over n plus 1, or as I said, n is the old size. And if that is true, then you insert x at the root, and otherwise you continue. Now insert at root is itself very, sim very simple. It just said says split the node, uh, split the subtree of this node x, uh, of the root x, around the key x. So conceptually speaking, this is given a tree and a certain value x, and then there's some way to cut this tree in half to have all the keys less than x and all the keys greater than x in two separate trees. And once we have that, we can certainly just add x as the common root of these two. And then we return that. So, of course, the magic is in this procedure split. But this is also not really complicated. You can easily write it as a recursive procedure. And I'll just give you a, a, a small graphic representation because that's, I think, much more readable than in, in code. Uh, let's move it down a bit. Here. So split has two cases. If the tree with respect to which we split is less than the current root of the tree, then we have to put the root into the right of these two subtrees. And the left subtree, um, okay, first this uh, y has a subtree r, and that can just remain on, it's all on the safe side. But then we have to split the left subtree. So there's a left, left, and left, right. Then we obtain recursively by splitting the left subtree according to x. And then we just attach these two. So LL is all the keys that are smaller than X and L. So these will form all the keys smaller than X in that case. And for the larger ones, we just attach them to Y. And the other case is symmetric. We then have for the right tree, the two subtrees that we re obtain recursively. And in a symmetric sense, so y then has to be here. And uh, right, right is this one. So if you write it down like this, it looks a bit opaque how it actually works in a tree, but it's clearly well defined. And it fulfills this, uh, this functional contract. 
the more interesting thing about this is that if the tree that split is given is a random BST, then the trees that it spits out, the two trees, are again random BSTs, namely of these uh, smaller key sets, and they're independent. And this is, it sounds kind of uh, surprising maybe, but the point is just the, the key, the, the trees that we return are just built from the structure of the input tree and that was random by definition. So you can just again calculate that, uh, well by induction, the root of the tree has the right distribution and then the subtrees have the distribution recursively. So it's actually, once you see the procedure, it's pretty simple, but maybe it's not, not completely trivial to come up with. Let's look at uh, delete. Uh, here, interestingly, I did not forget the null case. That's good to know. And the delete is, um, we go down the tree as long as we have the not, not yet found our key x. And once we found it, then we do an operation called join. And by the return, we just replace the pointer to the current node, which is root. We replace that by whatever is returned by join. And that way, uh, root is actually deleted from the tree. Let me add, in both cases, we should here, before we return, we should update size. And the same here. Um, so here, in, in that case, you should have it below these two. Okay, again, the magic is in a, in a sub-procedure that I'll sketch graphically again. Join is given two trees with the property that everything in the one tree is smaller than everything in the second tree. So all keys here are greater than all keys there. And well, the way we call it, this will always be the case because we use two subtrees from the large tree. Now we again have several cases, but uh, this time uh, there are essentially random choices, except for the first one. So if both subtrees are empty, um, which in this pattern matching sense would actually be that both are just a leaf, right? Uh, then the result is also empty. The interesting part is if, as I draw them here, um, they are not empty, then we have two different outcomes and we choose among them randomly. And these are the probabilities you've seen before. That's the probability that in the resulting, in the joint tree, either x or y is the root of, this, of the complete tree. Well, in this says x should be the root, so we make x the root. Then the left part of x must remain unchanged. And for the right part, we have these keys that are greater than x, but these are also all greater than x. So what we attach to the right uh, child of x is just the result of the join of these remaining trees. Okay. And then symmetrically, if we make y the root, and what we attach here is join of complete left sub, complete left tree, and this, this part. And that way we again, um, so we obtain one tree that contains all the keys, 
And again, this procedure has the property if these input trees um, have a random BST shape with respect to their keys, then the resulting key will also be a random BST. So this is what I summarize here in this in the first theorem. Whenever we have any sequence of insert and delete operations, then the resulting tree is still a random BST. So randomized BSTs have the same shape as random BSTs. That's maybe the, the shortest way to state it. And um, we will skip the detailed proof. The idea is that you show inductively that these operations split and join have the this randomness preservation property I just sketched. And then another induction shows that insert and delete have the same property. It's not really a very complicated proof. Um, I think it's, uh, we have more pressing topics to discuss than in this class, so that's, I'll leave that out. Uh, for the operations, the costs of a search in such a randomized binary search tree, uh, which I identify with the number of nodes that we visit, which for the search means also the number of comparisons between keys, um, but for well, for the other operations where we modify the tree, it means the number of changed pointers or proportional to the number of changed pointers. So this is a, a simple model of costs here. Now for the search, we just by this theorem know that uh, this, the shape is the same as in a random BST. So we will have uh, this two L and N nodes the depth of a typical node or leaf and the same result in with high probability and that's what we've seen last time and for insert and delete we have the same kind of uh, costs as in trips there's only a, a constant number in expectation of nodes that we have to touch with these insert at root or split respectively join operations that's maybe a bit uh, surprising at first sight since in particular insert uh, tries for all the nodes from the root down the tree it uh, flips this random coin and uh, asks whether we should change that node but the point is uh, for a node that's high up in the tree the probability is also very small that this is really changed so the expectation um, in that case is, is always constant. Uh, one thing that's maybe, yeah, that's kind of obvious from these recursive representations is even in the worst case, split and join uh, never use more than uh, one follow one path in the tree. So if the tree has logarithmic height, then they will for sure never need more than that. Um, that they only need constant time for the average node that they're invoked on depends uh, on something that we've already analyzed. Namely the spines, but let me first uh, write down for number one, this is just the consequence of the theorem above. And well, and our result for random BST. Let's 
say this is for search. Now for insert or split, the point is that it depends on which node we invoke that. But you can show that in the resulting tree, so the output of split, when you add the new root again, um, I'll show you an example in a second, the nodes that we touch during the creation of this tree with split are exactly the nodes that we find on the spine. I guess this is best seen in a quick example. Assume we have this tree where there's a certain part of the tree that we are not so interested in. But then here is, is the leaf and this stops. Um, and assume we essentially split along this line, so with the value that would correspond to this gap. Uh, and you can imagine this is in an insert, so you just inserted an element here. Now you determine it should become the root of this subtree. So you have to split this, this subtree. So it, it could be more above in this tree, but that's not changed. Okay. Now how would split uh, operate? It first asks, is one to the left or to the right? Well, it's to the left. So we keep one as the root of the left tree. And that means this left half of the tree is boring. It's never split, so we can just copy that. Uh, but there's something here that we have to determine recursively. So let's do that explicitly. The recursive call is on this subtree here. And this time three is to the right. So we will in the end return this as the right subtree. And this part doesn't change. And then the left here is to be determined. And that's splitting this part, this tree along that line, but there's essentially nothing to be done. So we just chop off a null pointer. So that's That's this. Now if we return this up, then at this point what we split, the right part becomes the child here, and this becomes the, the second tree that we return. Now we come up back from this, then we copy the right tree and make the left the subtree here. And so this is the result of the, of the split operation. And now if you look at the nodes that we actually had to touch, that was here we touched the one, here we touched the three, and we touched the two. And these are exactly the nodes that you find here on the spine of this subtree. Uh, there might be a few more along this line on the on the other spine, but we never have more than the nodes. Uh, we never do more, we never touch more nodes than we have on the spine in this, in this resulting tr Oh, sorry, this was, no, no, no. This was the wrong way. These are the nodes that we touched, but what we actually do in the end is that this corresponds, this is the important part. I confused myself. In the end, we will use these 
two subtrees that split returns to make the newly inserted key the root of this subtree. And in this tree, it happens to be that all the nodes that we touched are exactly the nodes on the spines, and there's no other nodes. And well, so the spines is what we already analyzed. Uh, that was last time. So that means for insert, we touch. Uh, so we analyzed it. What's the left of the length of the left and right spine of the ith internal node? And essentially, we for each insert, we know what the i is in the resulting tree. So we can even give the exact expectation in that case. Um, and And for both cases, it was a bit less than one that the average length of this spine, the average number of nodes on this spine that we had. So it's less than two in expectation. You might recall the analysis with these nice uh, ancestor indicators and so on. Okay, so that was the part for split. The part for join is a bit diff is a bit similar, but um, uh, but now we have to do to look in the tree before we delete. And I think in this case, uh, we can't give such an exact guarantee. We can just bound the number of touched nodes. And the reason is that join is actually randomized, right? It's uh, which of the sub which of the subtree roots becomes the root of the final tree is based on coin flips. And there's usually some coin flips that will go on for longer and others will finish earlier. I'll I'll show an example again, and then this, this becomes clear. But still, we can say it's at most all the nodes on the spines. Uh, let's, let's see if we can fit the example here. So assume this is the root of a subtree that we now would like to delete. And we have some further subtree. Now here, assume there's no further nodes, but the triangles might, might have more. So how does delete work? We delete that node, and then we have two separate subtrees that we would like to join. Now join is actually randomized, so we can have uh, two different versions. Either this or this can become the root with a certain probability. If we decide to make one the root, then this tree is simply copied. And the, ref the, left, the right subtree is the join of this tree. and the complete right subtree. Whereas in that case, if we have the four, then we copy that part. Then we have to join on the left side. Well, and from the right subtree, there's only an, a null pointer or an external leaf left. 
which means that this call will immediately return to just take this tree. The join with an empty tree is does not branch further. And in this case, we had to touch the node 4 and we had to touch the node 1, but we actually didn't have to touch the node 2. But in the original tree, the spine is all these nodes, so the 2 would have been part of the spine. But in that case, we could avoid uh, going down this pond, the tree, because essentially the right tree was exhausted earlier. Now in the left side, we still have two non-empty trees. So we have a split in two more cases, whichever we make the root. If we decide to make two the root, then the left part can stay. Well, now uh, again, we have a recursive call for join with the right subtree here and whatever is left of this, but that's empty. So I'll uh, simply put that here. And the other direction is kind of symmetric. We now first put the four. Then we have a recursive call with this and the empty tree, which immediately returns to this tree. And you see that in these cases, we actually had to touch all the nodes. Even though the last calls were not really doing something, we kind of visited them, whereas in this case we didn't. So this is, it's not really a, f a full proof of why this holds, but it gives you the, the essential idea why this is the, the cost of the operations. Now let me remark that split and join are actually helpful operations because often you would like to have, with the sorted dictionary, the possibility to split it into two separate ones or to join it. Uh, that's maybe not, it's not the most common operation, but sometimes for priority queues, you might want to have something like that. Uh, and that this is directly given by these operations here. So another little pro of this structure. So with that proof sketch, uh, I'd like to finish this first part on random, randomized algorithms where we looked at ways to uh, escape a worst case, right? We looked at ways to cope with adversarial inputs. Now an entirely different um, topic is to use randomness when Non-determinism is actually easy. What do I mean by this? Um, so a problem in NP had the property that there is some certificate and when we find it, we're happy because we can prove that the instance is, is a yes instance. And if we can't find it, or we can prove that we can't find it, then we know it's a no instance. Um, but of course, because there are so many possible certificates and non-determinism could mean that there's a single accepting one. Uh, this doesn't give a poly time algorithm. Uh, but for some cases, for some instances of problems, uh, we have many different certificates that work. So we can just guess a random certificate and check if it's accepting. And if it is, we're in good shape. We have found one. And if not, then we can at least with a certain probability announce that the input is not in the, in the language. And one example where we, where we can come to such a situation is prim primality checking. So given a number, is it a prime or not? Or maybe I should call it compositeness testing because what we're uh, designing will actually be an algorithm to decide whether an, a number is not prime. 
I've already talked about the significance of this problem primes because it's easily seen to be in co NP. It's not easily seen, but can be shown to be in NP because you can uh, give a tricky certificate for a number to be prime using some theorems from number theory. Um, so it would have been one of these problems that might decide whether co NP and NP actually uh, fall together or, or maybe not, but it's actually shown, it was shown a few 15 years ago that it's also in P. Nevertheless, the algorithm, the deterministic algorithm that was developed for primes doesn't help in practice too much. It's slower than the methods that we will look at now. I'm not presenting the best method from a practical point of view because these are pretty sophisticated in terms of number theory. And I'm not a very, a very big fan of algebraic excursions. We already had stochastic excursions, excursions enough for that course. Uh, but we'll use a, f a few results that are basic enough that you might have seen a proof of them in a, in a preliminary math course. And that suffice for this, uh, for, the, for making this point. Now, just on a conceptual level, uh, how can we make this formal, what, what do we mean by many, uh, many witnesses or many certificates? Um, when can we hope to guess a good a certificate? These are actually three points that we need. There must be an easy way to check or use a, any given certificate. If it actually is one, then it should be efficient to check. That's kind of the definition of certificate, but there's a difference between checkable in poly time and practical in efficiency. efficiency. Um, so uh, I think the first two points essentially collide. Let's just take it two points. The important part here is that the set of all candidates um, must contain many certificates. So I'll use candidates in the, in the classical VP sense. This would be all bit strings of a certain length. And then the certificates are all these so that the verifier accepts. Well, and this many should be so that we can amplify the probability accordingly. Okay. Um, for the specific problem of uh, primality checking, the simplest um, statement that we can use for something like this it's actually, well, we can actually do even simpler. As a zero step, we could take the candidate set for the number n to just be the numbers 2 up to n minus 1, which could be divisors. And yeah, you're right, square root of n would actually be sufficient. Now round it down probably is enough. 
in the end that doesn't really help a lot uh, because well n is given in binary right so this would still be exponential exponentially many but that's not a problem I mean um, not per se so uh, you're right if we have if we have to check all then we could stop at square root uh, the point here is, is a bit different. So this is the set of all candidates that we sample from. We're not trying to check all of them. We're trying to sample a random one and see if that's a divisor. So the candidates are this, and the set of witnesses or certificates is the set of all divisors of n. Okay. So you guess a random number and check if it divides the number. That's the most simple, the simplest primality check that you can do. And in that case, it's, it's not a problem that there are exponentially many candidates. The problem is that we can't guarantee enough witnesses because if n is the product of two primes, then there's essentially just these two primes that are witnesses. So witnesses to the fact that n is composite, um, but a lot more candidates. So we have uh, one over n essentially prob uh, probability to, to draw a witness. So it's not a complete failure, but you need many samples from that until you have a good uh, probability to not mistakenly report this uh, to be a prime. And at that point in time, n is too much because the number is given in binary, so that would be, I mean, I can write it pseudo polynomial, okay. But that's not actually of any value here. It's an exponential algorithm if we have to run so many samples. So that was uh, the, the idea zero, if, if you like. We can do a bit better if we uh, pull out some algebra results. And one thing is uh, Fermat's little theorem. So it's little because it's not his last theorem, which are unrelated. So for any prime and any number that could be a divisor, if you like, if you take a to this power p minus 1 and then modulo p, then you get 1. So if the number is a prime, then uh, you can just take any of these a's and check if this is true. And if it's not true, you know for sure that p is not a prime. So I'll write it in the more computer scientists point uh, way of writing modulo equivalences when it's of course the same where here mod is the binary operation uh, if this is not the case then p is not prime well but if it is uh, we don't know mm. And the problem is that there's the so-called Carmichael numbers. Which fulfill this uh, property. So they also fulfill this for all A. Uh, but they're not prime. So even if we could make it 
So even if we could prove that if p is not a prime, then the many numbers a do not fulfill this, uh, that it's still not a, a very reliable method because there's infinitely many of these, which is uh, by no means a trivial result. It's just a um, result that I'm, I'm citing here. So uh, this approach doesn't really work out, even though it's in principle of the right form. It's a bit uh, too easy for giving a good uh, primality test. So we pull out a bit more of algebra. Another classic criterion for primes, that's it's called Euler's criterion sometimes. And this is actually a characterization, an if and only if for primes. Uh, the problem is that we will, uh, okay. So first of all, the theorem holds in, in general. For any uh, odd number, but all the others are not prime anyway, so they're not interesting. P is a prime exactly when this condition is true for all values A. So ZP, that's of course essentially the numbers one up to p minus one, right? If I write the square brackets, then just dot dot, okay. So this time you don't just take a to the power of p minus one, but you take p minus one half. And that's why p should be an odd number. And then if the result is either one or, well, this is equivalent to minus one modulo p. So the version with one and minus one is, is maybe uh, the more commonly stated one. So this is again a result I would not like to uh, prove. But we can use this um, as a basis for our primality test. The point is that the criterion itself is, is still not sufficient. For a good test, we need that there's uh, many witnesses. And okay, for the case that uh, n is odd, but also n minus one half is odd. So we have an additional restriction. Uh, we can easily prove that the if n is prime, then okay, for all of these, this holds. This is just the theorem. But if n is not prime, then half of the elements does not fulfill this, uh, con this, this criterion. So we have a good chance to just pick a random a and check if, it's, if this is fulfilled or not, okay? And again, not a full idea, uh, not a full proof, but just a, a rough idea. Um, if you define witness of n to be the set of all a of this kind, um, that they prove that a number n is not a prime. So. This is not in this set. Uh, then this is one set and the rest is all other numbers. Then using some algebra you can show that there is an, an injective function from the set of these non-witnesses to the set of witnesses. And if this is injective, then that means, of course, that there's at, at least as many witnesses as non-witnesses. And that leads finally to the algorithm um, that I promised you. 
it's got a restriction that's inherited from this theorem n n must be odd, that would be fine, but also n minus one half must be odd. But if that's fulfilled, then we can sample such a number, check, uh, well, compute this value and check if it's in the allowed set. If not, then we know it, it violates Euler's criterion, so um, we can output n is not prime. And if the result is in this allowed set, then we can say probably prime. We might be wrong because we know there's half the numbers A that even for um, a prime, for a non-prime might, might give this result. Uh, but we can of course then repeat this to amplify the probability. And even in the, in the given form, this is a, a one-sided error Monte Carlo algorithm for the for the language of composite numbers. So which means whenever you say, yes, it is composite, it is not prime, you're sure. And for uh, primes, your answer is at least correct half the time. Okay, this strange condition above, you can also translate to, if you take n modulo four, then the result must be three. So this is kind of excluding half the interesting numbers, um, which might not be, might not, might not be so nice. Uh, I don't know whether I have it on the slides. So it's it's possible to drop this. Because we can we can improve this theorem also for the case uh, that this is one. But that's a lot more effort to prove. Well, I only give you a sketch here with Uh, that requires much more algebra. And then if you go that route, uh, there's um, more recent and more complicated methods that actually outperform this solo way strassen method in terms of the probability and in terms of efficiency anyway. But this is kind of the, the simplest method that still is, is usable. Okay, this corollary is kind of trivial. It's basically what you've shown in the exercises that whenever you have a one-sided error Monte Carlo method, you can make it a two-sided error for the, well, for the uh, inverse problem. So here we detect composite numbers, but we actually want to detect prime numbers. But of course you can, by accepting errors in both direction, you can do that. Uh, even for the restricted version of this primality test, there's a sensible application. Uh, and this is really a, a practical thing that's relevant in cryptography, namely sampling large primes. So you would often like to be able to generate uh, a random number that's prime and a huge number, so with a few hundred digits. Uh, and a simple way to do that is essentially to just keep on drawing numbers and use the solovey strassen algorithm to check if it's prime or not, right? And now this is uh, giving a few more details, um, but it's actually is just the idea that I mentioned. If you sample a few random bits and compute the number like this, um, where you make sure that the first bit is always set, otherwise the number might be too small. And also the, the least significant bit is always set, that gives you an odd, an odd number. Um, okay, and the way it's written down here, uh, you're not restricting to the case modulo four is three. So if you add another, if you replace another of these random bits by a one, you can make sure that you always consider random numbers that are modulo four, that are three modulo four, right? 
and then you can use the restricted version or you take the, the general version that uh, accepts any kinds of odd numbers. And then the trick is to repeat this uh, a certain number of times. So first of all, for each number that you sample, you do a certain number of independent runs of the primality test because you have to amplify uh, the probability of this one. And then also the whole procedure is iterated uh, a several number of times in case you have not found a prime yet because you wouldn't want uh, every other time to return to the user, sorry, didn't find one, you just keep on doing a few more times. And these numbers are chosen um, so that you get a reasonable guarantee. Um, so this gives you a two-sided error Monte Carlo method for choosing a random prime. If you just take L as both parameters, so L on the one side was the length of the number in bits, and K always says, uh, also says the number of repetitions of the primality test is. Uh, is sufficient if you <coughs> use it L times. So this is the algorithm and okay. There's two-sided error Monte Carlo method and poly time for generating Primes of length n. This is actually a theorem that we still have to discuss a bit because um, it requires uh, a null knowledge on how many primes there are in a certain range. So with primes of um, of length L, so with exactly L binary digits, there's still a lot of such numbers, roughly two to the L, uh, but maybe we, for some L there isn't even a prime in that range. Might that be possible? Um, luckily, we're, we know that this can't be. There's the so-called prime number theorem which says uh, if you denote by pi of x the number of prime numbers, the number of primes that are less than uh, the number x you give. Okay, so that counts all smaller primes. Then you know asymptotically for large x, this behaves like ln x divided by ln x. So if all numbers were prime, you would just have x. Now it's not quite that, but it's still it seems that there's a, a lot of primes. It's almost uh, a fixed fraction of all numbers that's prime. It's a bit less because you divide by something that goes to infinity, so it's still, uh, in a sense, small o of x. So it's less than a fixed fraction, but still there's many. And um, there's another result called Petros postulate that for every number, so there is a prime for every number n, there is a prime between n and 2n, um, which is if you take n for the smallest number of, of these with L bits, then you, this says there's at least one such prime. So in our algorithm, 
we draw a uniform number from this interval 2 to the L minus 1 up to 2 to the L minus 1 down. That's by this. Um, well, we could actually restrict this to the odd numbers, but that doesn't make a very big difference. And the probability to hit a prime in that case is then very roughly uh, 1 over L. It's not. And this this weak form just gives you that there's one prime in that range. That's definitely too pessimistic. I guess we should take into account that we use a lot of repetitions here. But this should be in every iteration, otherwise uh, that wouldn't work. So is it, well, the probability to hit a prime is essentially given by pi of x, because that's how many primes do I have that are smaller than the number? And then I could divide by x. So if we start pi of x divided by x, Then what we get is that this is 1 over ln x. OK, and x is, so essentially, 2 to the l. And that's indeed 1 over l. That's maybe a step that I should have written down in the notes. So because we, we have so large uh, numbers, I mean, this is a bit sketchy. This is an asymptotic equivalence. Uh, and yeah, if you want to be rigorous, you should use uh, actual bounds at this point. So the, there's stricter form of this theorem that give you lower and upper bounds that are not just true in an asymptotic sense. So I think we must, we must call this a sketch. But the result is uh, is the correct one, that's for sure. But yeah, uh, we'll use a few sloppy asymptotic approximations at this point. So this is the probability that the probability that a random number from our range actually is a prime, or it's roughly like uh, it, this is roughly the probability that we have a prime. But just because we were lucky enough to draw a prime doesn't necessarily mean that we detect it as a prime. Uh, we might reject it as a composite number. So the probability that we also output that, is a, it, that this is a prime, even though we actually had a composite number, is bounded by this. For a single run of Solovay-Strassen, that would be 
probability one half because it's a one-sided error Monte Carlo method. And we do K um, independent iterations. So this is the probability amplification for one-sided error Monte Carlo methods that you consider it in, in the exercise sheets. Well, and if K is large enough, then this is essentially negligible for for large k and well we even choose k equals l so this probability goes down uh, exponentially fast so it's very unlikely that we will um, output a wrong prime and this is of course an important um, property of such an algorithm we wouldn't like to have its return uh, wrong numbers that are not actually prime, but we can't completely exclude that case. And what we do next is um, to amplify this, we repeat this several times. Um, K is already gone. Then the number of repetitions that we need is geometrically distributed if we just keep going forever. So it's the usual Markov inequality trick that works here. geometrically distributed with this parameter. So that's the probability to, su to succeed in one step. And well, then you know the expected number of iterations. It's just the reciprocal. So L iterations would, um, would be needed in expectation if you just continue sampling. Uh, but what we actually do is continue much longer. Two L squared iterations. The probability that the number of the number of iterations that you need. is greater than, so that's Markov's inequality. Now we just determine this to be L. And if we insert 2L squared, then what we find here is 1 over 2L. And well, for practical values where L is like 300, 500, this is essentially small enough. Um, uh, there was a comment on the running time that I wanted to make. So we do a, an L squared number of iterations and then each has to do this uh, solo way Strassen this L number, L times, that's already cubic. And well, here you have to compute these numbers. So if you do it simply, then the running time will become O of L to the fifth, which is certainly polynomial, but also not, not very efficient, right? Uh, but this is already a usable method, even though in practice, as I mentioned, uh, there are more, more refined versions that are often used. 
Uh, so far for primality checking, that was an example of this uh, theme when we have many witnesses, then we can get along with just guessing one. And I mean, there's, there's many more algorithms that are like this and they become more and more complicated because, because you can often reformulate a, problems, a problem in a different way so that a different notion of candidates for certificates comes up and then you can try to prove that there's many of these and so on and so forth. Um, but I want to discuss something else for the rest of the time, uh, which was the, the third part of the third category that we had for randomized algorithms, that's fingerprinting. And the, the core idea of fingerprinting is hashing, which you of course know. Um, so we have some universe, just to fix a bit of notation, we have some universe U, which is all allowable values. And in, this, in the simplest case, uh, we want to store some dictionaries, so a subset of U. Um, we assume that the universe is very large, uh, and we now use a function h that maps the universe into a, some range r, and that should be much smaller than u. So that we can use r as, for example, the address space of some uh, hash table. So say the size of r is m. Then often the terminology for hashing is that r is, is a set of bins. So the function h assigns one of these m bins to each of the elements of the universe. And that gives you a partition. And if you're lucky, then there will not be many elements per bin so that you can do s some simple linear search in each bin or something like that. Uh, well, we will usually denote by n the size of the set that you want to store. Okay, so the mathematical model for this is to throw n balls into m bins. Where throw means, I mean, evaluate the function, so it's uh, for each of the elements of the universe, it's predetermined into which bin it will fall. So you might ask where the randomization comes in, right? Uh, up to now, there is nothing random with that. Um, and the randomization comes in, in two places. The first is I would like to just discuss briefly some classical results on balls and bins, which are usually left out of elementary algorithms courses because of well, because they require tail bounds, actually, that's, I think that's the, the most critical part that you're missing in an elementary course. Uh, but that's actually a very interesting result, and it's not hard to prove, so I would like to discuss that first. So we use a random model for, well, kind of... Uh, a worst case for hashing, but for uniform hashing, which is then a random assumption over the inputs again. And the second case where randomization comes into play again is for universal hashing, which you probably also know that's uh, we draw h from a certain class of hash functions randomly. That's again of the type defend against um, bad input cases. And then there's the third part on hashing that's perfect hashing, which is more of the shape of the next uh, topic, namely random sampling. And 
these terms are so similar that it's easy to mix them up. So uniform hashing is an assumption on the input model and it just assumes that all hash sequences are equally likely or whenever we insert a new key this is independent of all others of the hash values that we've seen before and essentially also the, those later to come so the, the version you formulate in an elementary course is the uniform hashing assumption means all sequences of hash values are equally likely and for us that we now know a bit more about stochastic notation is uh, the numbers, the bin numbers are all IID independent and identically distributed. Universal hashing, I also already explained it, perfect hashing is hashing where you disallow collisions. And that's for static dictionaries where the set S is known up front. You can show that you can relatively efficiently compute an, a perfect hash function, which then allows you to store that set with little overhead and guaranteed O of one access time. Uh, we'll see whether we'll discuss that, but um, not today. Okay, so for our first application of randomization in the context of hashing, uh, we will look at the analysis of, of a scenario that, might, that you've uh, might heard before. That's the uniform hashing assumption. Which assumes that the, the hash value for each new item we insert into our hash table that they are I identically distributed and independent and uniform. So each new key is, is uniformly chosen to fall into any of the, um, into the bins that we have in the hash table. And that's about the best that you can hope for. That's the best possible hash function because it gives you the perfect load balancing between the different um, cells of the hash table. Uh, the interesting thing is, for one thing, um, in many practical applications, if where the, the keys that you insert actually follow some unknown distribution that depends on the application there you often have this assumption uh, holding true even for a fixed hash function within a good approximation and the second thing is there's um, deep theory about hash functions that show that you can come somewhat close to this um, even if you're even if you don't know the the keys that are going to be inserted and uh, so this, this assumption is a strong assumption, but it's uh, not, f not unreasonable. And it makes sense to look at what that means. Now the mathematical model is abstracting a bit from the hash table and just says we have a number of bins, m bins. And we throw n balls choosing uniformly between the bins IID for all the balls into these bins. And then after a while, we will have a certain number of balls in each bin. And we can denote the number of balls here uh, by these axes. Uh, then what you find is that actually these x1 up to xm all have the same distribution, the same marginal distribution, uh, but 
the axes are not completely independent. because they have to sum to n and therefore they are if you fix all but one then the last one is completely determined so they cannot be independent still they are not uh, not so far from being independent because well the dependence is of a, a specific kind that you can actually uh, deal with but uh, this is nothing we will go into detail so from this um, it directly follows that the expectation of all of these is the same. And it's just the perfect n divided by m, where you reduce the amount of balls exactly by the number of bins. Now the interesting question is how close uh, the typical values of these axes are to the expectation. If you look at the single one, then this will be pretty concentrated uh, in, a, in a kind of informal qualitative sense. It will be concentrated around its mean because we know that the binomial distribution is concentrated if the number of repetitions is large. Uh, but what is not so clear is what happens if also m uh, gets large. So uh, one classic scenario that we look at here is that actually n and m are the same. We have the same number of bins and the same number of balls. So on average only one ball per bin. Uh, but still in this case, so obviously the expectation is just one ball. If you take the maximum, so this is nothing but max of xi, if you take the bin that got the most balls, then you can show that it actually has some of the order log n divided by log log n balls. In this theorem we only show an upper bound, but you can actually also show that it's uh, with high probability also a lower bound. Uh, so you can make this a theta, but we will only show the upper bound, which is, which is the interesting part for applications if you would like to argue that hashing is not so bad. So before we prove that, let's maybe uh, note down implications. So all of, all of the implications are under the uniform hashing assumption, which I talked about before is reasonable enough to assume it here. And that says that hashing is never too bad, even for the worst case bin. It's still a tiny bit better than a BST search, because that would be logarithmic or binary search if, if we have it sorted, right? On the other hand, um, if worst case is important, so if we need a guarantee for every single access and not just in an amortized sense over a sequence of accesses, it's well it's only very slightly better than BSTs because this log log factor that you shovel off here is is just very small for any values of n in this universe. So it just shows you uh, the limits of this model and it also shows the sharp contrast to this result 
any fixed bin, if you keep m fixed and make n large, gives you a very good concentration. But in the typical uh, application of hashing, where also the number of bins is large, you will usually find one that's uh, that get, gets much many more balls than its expectation would predict. So let's see how we can uh, prove this upper bound. We will start with a simple preliminary thing. The maximum is greater than a certain value if any of these is greater than a certain value. So with a union bound, we have n times the chance that say x1 is greater or equal than this bound. So now let's focus on this. The probability that x1 is greater or equal than a certain value can be written as the probability of a union of events, a large union over all subsets of the n balls so that this subset contains exactly m balls and then the event is the balls in this subset that we draw all land in bin 1. So certainly if x1 has more than m balls then there must be a subset of size exactly m so that this is true but usually these events will not be uh, disjoint right they're they're overlapping but this is not a problem for the union bound we can still apply this and count the number of things that we have and then for any of these sets the probability is the same it's just the probability that these i balls land in bin 1. Now we don't say anything about the other balls. So we can certainly upper bound the probability here by 1 over m to the n because that just says for the m balls at least I have to hit the other ones and no matter what happens with the others. Now uh, recall that actually n and m are the same. So what we, we can rewrite this by pulling out the, the binomials. 1 over n to the m, so here because they are the same. And now we can cancel a few things. Uh, this part is actually less than 1 because uh, n factorial is less than n to the m because this, these are, uh, if we combine these, well, okay, forget what I said, these two together consist of exactly n factors. So that's n, n minus one down to one, n factors. And here we have n, 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 m times. And then we continue with the rest of the factorial, n minus m, n minus m minus one, down to one. So there's a certain part here that will just exactly cancel. So the back part here will cancel precisely. And then there's a certain part left where on the top we have smaller values than here. So what remains is less than one. So we can bound the whole thing by one over m factorial. Now with the second side calculation. You know Sterling's formula which gives you an asymptotic value for m factorial 
and you can actually show that the first term of this asymptotic expansion that the Stirling formula gives you is an upper bound. So Stirling's formula which in the simplest form says m factorial is asymptotic to this term and you can give it um, with more precision with more terms and you can show that this is actually an upper bound. Uh, sorry, it's a, a lower bound, a lower bound. And that's good because we need it the other way around here. We have one over m factorial. Yeah, you can show that this is a lower bound because uh, the, the second term would be then a positive term. Okay, so 1 over m factorial is given by this and well we can simply drop this term and then what we are left with is e over m. To the m. So we're we're only making it larger by dropping a one over something with m. So this is let's do it. Uh, let's include it first. And then you notice that this is uh, less than one. You so so you can drop it. So we have uh, this nice shape, e over m to the m, and that's what we will use. So let's give this a name. Now, for the claim, we're again considering the max, the maximally loaded bin, and we're claiming that with high probability this bound holds. So we have to show that the probability to be larger than c times this bound uh, must be polynomially decreasing. So in the following I will drop these parentheses around the nested logarithms. Uh, it should always be parenthesized like this. It's just um, unnecessary clutter in writing. Uh, we assume in the following that c is, is greater th than 3 and that's fine because all that we have to show is that uh, for every constant so that we bound the probability as n to the minus d there's a c th so that we can show this. So let me write down that For every d, there exists a c so that the probability of this thing, so this, is well, O of n to the minus d, or n to the d if you allow a negative here anyway. So that's what we are uh, going to show. We do so by simply starting with a c and then we'll show that we can uh, go back in the end by choosing um, C, we can get this for any D. So it's fine in that case to assume that C has a certain lower bound because you can just uh, start uh, with, you can just take a larger one. That only makes the results this, this weaker. Now the first step is to apply the union bound. That was the, the very first part. So n times the probability that x1 is greater or equal this c ln n over ln ln n. And for this, this is just some value of m so that we can use our inequality star here.
No. Mm, this one needs a bit more. Still. This E divided by M means there's an E divided by C. And then we have um, 1 over M. So ln ln n divided by ln n. And then this whole thing to the m, which is this one again. So c ln n divided ln ln n. OK, that looks scary enough. So the good thing about this assumption is that that means that this is less than 1. So we can drop that and only make the term larger. That's the first thing we're doing. And the second thing is we rewrite the whole product here in terms of an exponential function. The first part is n is x of log n, that's easy. Then we have this term, which we can write as x of c times the exponent, and then log of the old base. And here we drop this term. So it's ln ln n divided ln n. Well, and log of a, a ratio is just the minus of the logs, right? That means uh, for one we have, let's pull this log out. Then we have C divided ln ln n. And then the upper term is a C log 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 n, triple log. And for the second term, we subtract because we divide. And that's actually a nicer one because there the log log n below, uh, the log log n from, from this here and the log log n below here, they just cancel. So it was log log n divided log log n and that just goes away. And now we can combine these two and indeed, we can just pull out a certain number of these. So this is a 1 minus c times log n that we can move out. So if we pull out oh. let's do it in, in super slow-mo. We have one minus C in total. We can write that as two minus C minus one. So then we're back at the same. And then another term for this. Then we pull these out to get n to the 2 minus c. And what we're left here with is something where you can, again, pull this out. And then we have C log 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 n divided by log log n. It's terrible. Minus 1. And now you notice that a triple log grows asymptotically a good deal slower than a, tr than a double log. So 
So this whole term is small o of 1, if you like. And that means for large enough n, it's less than 1. And then the whole term here is, is essentially negative. So what we have is that then the whole argument of x is negative, and then this is less than 0. So And then the exp is less or equal 1 for large n. So then we finally conclude for large n that this is less than n to the 2 minus c. And now you see if whatever d you start with, you can find the c so that uh, this is, is the case. So if you would like to have n to the d, then you pick your c as uh, d plus 2. And then you insert the c above and you see you find that. So this is not a problem. You can always pick a larger one. And then the whole thing, whole thing goes through. So we have shown that for any d there's a c so that the probability is with the c inserted is less than n to the d. And that's the statement that we want that we claimed the with high probability bound.